Hey everybody, I'm Jeffrey Masters, and this is LGBTQ and A, where we get to know different members of the LGBTQ community. Today I'm talking with Shadi Potoski. Shadi is the co-creator of the animated Amazon series Danger and Eggs. Stay tuned. Hey, Shaddy. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks for having me here. Yes. I like this place. Thank you. I'm excited to talk. Before we do, though, we just want to say to people listening uh, who have left comments on iTunes, thank you for that. That is one of the biggest ways people can find us and help us out. And if you haven't left a comment, now's the time. The time is now. Okay. Okay. Hold on. No, not you, Shaddy. Uh, okay. Thanks. <laughs> I never do. Okay. I will. So, for, I'm going to hold you to it. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, let's talk about you. So we okay. mentioned Danger and Eggs, your series. Mm -hmm. uh, it's animated. I want to be clear to people listening who have not seen it, though, that it's for children. It is not, you know, talking about sex and not drugs, and it's not a no. BoJack Horseman. No, it's not. It's a kid's animated show like Adventure Time or Steven Universe or one of those kind of 6 to 12-ish yeah. kind, of, kind of things. I know that you say it's hard to explain, but do you mind trying to explain oh, for us? Oh, well, it's about, <laughs> sure. No, I, that's... I know uh, that's your job. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't, I don't even have this down, but it's, it's this uh, very adventurous, teal-haired, fearless girl named Dee Dee Danger, and she is accompanied by this um, egg, giant talking egg filled with a safety egg that keeps Dee Dee from killing herself, basically. Yeah. Yeah, It's friendship. kind of about that. It's just about friendship. They have these kind of adventures in this park and go upstairs and downstairs and all around and yeah it's and so much fun it, it's such a it's got such a queer mm -hmm. sensibility without using labels and there's not you know romantic relationships and to indicate yeah. sexuality can you talk about making it kind of queer without when walking that line that's super hard yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah well it was definitely like as we were writing it you know, you want to write about your own experiences as a child. And it was like, I can't write this show without putting some of this stuff in there. So, um, yeah, it's, there's no relational anything in the show. There's no dating. We wanted, we didn't want a show that had like dating or like, oh, any crushes or anything like that. So we're trying to have queer people in there without, um, resorting too much to stereotypes, which is really hard. So, you know, some things are just that sort of like, it is kind of a stereotype, but it's just like not having, you know, uh, not following sex stereotypes of gender and having, you know, a more femme little boy or, or yeah. you know, a little more butch little girl or, or something like that. So there's those kind of things that are in there. Um, and then, but otherwise it's kind of handled by having like a lot of queer actors and um, people just kind of, performing their truth so we have um i think the one that people talk about the most online is there's a non-binary char character named milo who um everybody in the show uses they pronouns for milo and it's played by um tyler ford who's a um, agender like performer and ad advocate and activist and <laughs> being um so i think that that reality is like the thing that people are really picking up on just like you know, and it's maybe a little easier. We have a, a girl who just transitioned and sings the song about coming back to school as her authentic self, which sounds really like PBS when but, I say yeah. it. But but like there's these, but we just put the world, we just wanted to do speculative social fiction and like make a world that we wish we would have had when we were kids. Yeah, totally. Because it's this non-heteronormative, cis-normative world, mm -hmm. which I can't imagine exists for many like kids shows. No, it doesn't. I guess. I've only learned this since it's come out. Oh, really? And people are calling it, like, the gayest show ever. I mean, Steven Universe does a lot. So um, there's a lot of queer relationships in that. But no, nobody else has really been able to touch it as far as, like, there's Steven Universe and there's us and then the other networks. You know, animation is still very much, like, a cis, straight, white, men's world completely. But oh, really? but there's you can see a little bit more of it. I think on Disney Channel there's a show, Star vs. the Force of Evil, Evil that has some queer themes in it and stuff but uh, but you make it fairly obvious without like beating people over the head about it you know they're not like teachable moments i'm thinking of like the young trans character she sings the song that i'm the new girl but i'm not new yeah and it was such like a sweet way to say it. like i'm trans yeah without saying i that. just wanted to like give the experience that i had when i like went to trans day of remembrance and saw zoe luna stand up and speak about being a young trans girl and everybody is just sobbing 
and gets to see this person living their truth. And it was just like, it's just like showing that experience. That's all it was. It wasn't trying to like say, this is what trans is, or this is who, the, what the community likes. I mean, we did have a pride episode, which is kind of a big overt thing, but we just wanted to like put those experiences in that yeah. I've had and that other people have had where it's like, oh, there's this little trans girl. Isn't that just the the best? I know. Part <laughs> of me still is blown away every time I see a young trans person mm -hmm. that they're just able to come out, you know, in the yeah. world. Yeah. No, it's not great. <laughs> like for us, we're just like, uh, what? why didn't we? It's so, there's so much jealousy, but I think with a lot of queer people, it's like you look to youth and you're like, oh, I didn't, I missed all those rites of passage. And then this guy has a boyfriend in junior high or whatever or this guy gets to be the prom king with his boyfriend in this town you know like yeah it's, it's a weird thing for us to like both be really supportive of youth but also super jealous of course <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. But too with um and they can look up and see trans people in the media and on tv mm -hmm. when you were growing up like who who was out in trans um carolyn cossey i knew that was kind of the okay. first person that I knew like her name and that's who I kind of learned the word trans from um but yeah mostly just people on Jerry Springer right when I was when I was younger or like I saw it in porn in the woods and that was my first thing like building a fort in the woods and there's porn on the ground everywhere and I was like oh that's that kind of body oh, oh you found porn yeah I found oh, porn I in the woods. watching porn in the no woods. I was like there was wi-fi uh, YouTube no no <laughs> there was paper d dilapidated paper porn in the woods with the trans woman's body and it was like oh that's you know then i was trying to like read about this person there wasn't much information it was wow. mostly porn yeah so like that was that was really the only experience but carolyn cossey's my story came out i think when i was in high school and i was really into reading that and i had read like there was this playboy article with her that discussed like transgender stuff in it quite a bit and i read that and so that was in high school yeah Wow. I, I just think about in terms of like public notoriety, trans people have always been here, but like Christine Jorgensen made her yeah. big splash in like the 40s. And then from then on, it hasn't been that in the public consciousness. Well, I think that people, for me, it always was. I knew what it was when I was really young. Like I knew, like there's, I, I was taking the bus in Montana and like there was this barn where they, um, have this machine that takes sheep's testicles off and it's like a rubber band that slowly compresses you said we could swear or talk about that oh my god no stuff. please i'm fascinated so there's this yeah so that's how they remove the testicles of sheep i don't know why they need to do that you know for so they don't breed or or aren't violent or whatever it's castration so they do that and i like wanted to sneak into that i had so many so much desire to sneak into that barn because even though i didn't know exactly i knew that that would like not make me grow up a certain way that's like i knew enough about hormones and i knew enough about and the thing is is that like i always got teased about it like people were always like oh if you're gonna be a girl why don't you like get twenty thousand dollars and go to sweden you know they were like those kind of playground jokes so it wasn't not around but yeah because it was called christine jorgensen renee richards and then eddie murphy not <laughs> having relationships with trans women but it was always there if you and if you're trans you were like finding it and i'm sure it's the same if you're like a gay like if you're a gay man you're finding that stuff when you can it's like that's the kind of the yeah i mean in my, I, I don't know how old you are but I, i'm an ancient uh -huh. but in my experience i'm in the late 20s but I don't, it's not a secret i'm 28. okay exactly yeah. <laughs> i've been at like too long where i'm like lying about my age um you hear to hear first yeah no i <laughs> right? do too i do too exclusive yeah uh this is about me now no um oh maybe true in my experience, when I was in a closet, I had blinders on because I was like, I can't absorb any queer culture because then I'll be queer. Oh, and wow. so I actually didn't even watch like Will and Grace on TV. <sighs> but I, I didn't learn about what transgender meant until I was in college and accepting that I was queer and I'm looking at the different letters of the LGBTQ and not knowing what T meant and 
uh, it's like the character on the show philip he's he likes following the rules and he's like it's a good studier so i went and got a book by kate bornstein mm -hmm. you know yeah. and i'm like reading about it yeah and so i like how to like teach myself that's a great thing to do thanks for reading the books <laughs> because there's so many people don't, don't do that it's just like everybody's trying to figure out and it's like there's so many books yeah like there's so many books about being trans and about how we think about things and they're you know just read the books yes and there's so, so thank you <laughs> you're welcome yeah. there's the, like so many questions like on talk shows about like <laughs> surgeries and private parts it's like well that is all on the internet yeah you know just like google it if you're that curious yeah perfectly it's... none from an audience <laughs> well like the surgeries you can watch like a step by step like there's videos of like the whole thing if you want to see what that's all about yeah but yeah no it's so it's weird how much people are just refuse to know something yeah how many challenges there their beliefs but i feel like for me i always knew that i was trans i like it was very when i was really young it was really magical and i wanted like to be transformed but as i think around definitely i remember hardcore trying to hide it in middle school and then um and then high school and after high school i really knew and that's when i started getting really depressed by it oh really yeah and then when did you like start like changing your name um, well, I added an I to it, and that was just oh. to not confuse people over email from Shad to Shaddy, and that was just because, like, after I came up. But so it was, um, uh, yeah, it was later, way later. Okay. If, if initially, it was, we're getting really deep into this stuff, but initially, it was in my early 20s. I, you know, went to a psychiatrist, and I wanted to talk. Uh, she was, like, the leading trans specialist, and there was this sort of theory at the time that was kind of popular, and it was called... I forget what it was called, but basically it was like, if you're trans and attracted to women, then you enjoy the idea of yourself having a woman's body. It's almost like a sexual, almost like a fetish or something. And if you're trans and attracted to men, you're just a self-loathing homosexual. So like I was trans and attracted to men and she's just like, oh, you just can't accept yourself you know, you, you have such heteronormative ideas of the culture that you can't ex accept that you could be a man with a man. You have to think that you're going to be a woman to be with a man. And, like, I believed that. And it's a black and white option. It's one or the yeah, other. Yeah, and there was no such thing as bisexuality or stuff. It's 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 not a theory that we love. But it, but it just happened to be that when I went, it was very popular, and, and therapists were very excited about it because there was this new study that was just out. Um, and that the, the person who did this study is this Canadian, they, they've been kind of discredited, their clinic's been shut down, but it was kind of a reparative therapy almost kind of thing. It wasn't meant to be that way. It was just meant to be a way of to like really understand it. And so the therapist that I went to like believed that and I believed it for a long time too. So then it became through my twenties, it became all about like trying to like un gender my brain. And like, I read a lot of radical feminism and I was trying to like be more comfortable with just being a queer guy wow yeah but that didn't work out <laughs> <laughs> so then later it was like no i just i don't know what it is it still doesn't make any sense to me what doesn't make sense being trans oh. like it's still even though uh, and i go to therapy three days a week oh, really? and my therapist has to go like you know what just calm down about it you felt this way since you were four just like go with it it's the society's changing and so that's where i'm at now that's so funny to hear you say that yeah but but it makes sense that you're like a female right like doesn't does that even that no i don't know i oh. mean i think that within the the constructs of our culture i definitely associate more with femaleness and always have um yeah i don't know do you, okay, tell me this. Do you think about being trans or are you just shatty? You know? Oh, I think about being trans all the time. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, because yeah. one of the things that, I know you're friends with Jen Richards. Yeah. One of the things she said to me that I was so surprised by um, and, and, and heartened by was that sometimes she'll go days and then realize, oh, yeah, I'm trans. And she'll just forget about it. Oh, yeah. Okay, from that, to think of it that way, totally. Great. Yeah. I don't, I have to be reminded, but yeah, to me, it's just like, I don't, think of myself and my with this label yeah it's just it's you. so i feel so much like so many other women i know and a lot of gay men i know and but the thing happens and jen and i we transitioned around the same time so we've kind of like been friends for a long time and kind of gone through this together so we've both had these hills but like i go to gay bars and forget that i'm trans and then i'm like oh wow he's not interested in me like, like, because I'm not 
projecting dudeness. Oh, because you are attracted to men, so you're like just looking at guys. Well, Is yeah, I'm just there, and it's just like I just feel like one of the dude, like one of the boys. You know oh, what I mean? Like when I hang out with my gay friends, I have such a relational thing with them that I don't feel different. It's just friends. until until yeah, but it's sort of like. No, I'm more like these guys. I'm like these guys. We're the same. We have a similar like background. We have similar like um, cultural hi- history, and we have you know similar points of like references and things like that. So I feel like are they primarily then, queer too, or no? Yeah, I think they more identify as queer than as like a gay. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking about my like closest friends, and yeah. um, I think we overlap. So when I think I'm yeah. thinking about like Jeffrey Self and like that group that's like political. And gay, and, and like in that group, it's it just all, it just I just feel like I'm one of those guys. Yeah, <laughs> but they don't want to fuck me, <laughs> so it's like, you know, that's where. It... Yeah, I just I just think about like circles of friends and like do, does like does gender even like cross my mind when we're hanging out? Yeah, you know, I wouldn't look around and see like oh like there's two females here, you know. <laughs> well, that's the thing, and they're all calling. You know, they'll like my friend Jonathan Van Ness who does Gay of Thrones is like always says like. I mean, it's very femme, right? And very femme hair and a hairdresser and, like, way more femme than I am. So, like, when we're together, it's, like, she's more femme than I am. And then also, like, everybody just loses pronouns. And it's, like, she, he is interchangeable. And it's just, like, oh, she's being, you know. It's, it's just, it, it's, it just devolves. I know or, what you mean. Yeah. And, and that's some, a part of queer culture that I've never seen represented on TV. Because mm-hmm. I, I just feel like non-queer people would be too confused by it. Right. You know, like, oh, they're calling me she. Like, is like is he trans? Is he wanting to be? Like, and they don't get it. Well, that happens in the trans community, too. I think a lot of, like, you know, there was all the, this is becoming... <laughs> different kind of... so i made a cartoon but you know like the the lesbian trans women get confused by it they don't want that they tend to seem to want like a little bit harder lines and they don't want like they don't see like an association with drag at all whereas like i have a lot of good friends that do drag and i feel such an association you know it's different but it's yeah. not so different it's not like the people that do drag are like you know super butch and then just one night a week you know they're <laughs> i know what you mean They're femme guys. Yeah. I also use she as the highest form of compliment for my friends. It's almost like a nickname. Yeah. You know, if you asked me to call you Tiger, I would like love that. Uh, You know, (laughs) you can talk later if you want that. But, you know, and then like, but like, let me think about it a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. She is just like, it, it's, it's like companionship. Yeah. And I think we need that. Which, um, to like bring it back to your cartoon, even though I'm loving we're we're talking about. No, that no, already, no, I just I'm I'm so challenged by this all the time that I, I always want these conversations. It's not though. I wish I could just like settle and move on. Well, I, I think it show, goes to show that like the like non-binary nature of gender, or, like yes, the spectrum of it, and the fact that like it doesn't even exist, right? And I'm, I mean, I'm so heartened by the glad stats that 20% of youth uh, identifies as LGBTQ. Yeah. You know, like, they just yeah. don't care. But if it doesn't exist, why do I need to be trans? So it just gets like very like circular. You <laughs> yeah. Know? It gets a little troubling. Yeah. How funny. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I was, I absolutely loved was talking about um, in your TV show, uh, Chosen Families. Mm-hmm. And I just think like the gravity to be able to introduce that to a younger audience yeah and it's like life-saving for some people i i that was an accident it wasn't an accident but like i was like going for like a much more campy i knew that i wanted to pitch a pride episode right when we sold the show. And I knew that I wanted it to be based on like a Minneapolis Pride, which is this very amazing, it's a park, it's in the middle of the city, there's not a huge neighborhood, it goes right through downtown, the whole city comes out for it. And then it's very political and all the like candidates come down and there's churches there and there's tons of pet adoption and it's not ticketed and it's a lot of families and stuff. So I knew I wanted to do Pride and I knew I wanted to do that kind of Midwestern, small city pride and like a lot of stuff in our show has that kind of small city vibe um but i was going really campy at first it was going to be about like drag queens fighting zombie bacon and after like a lot of amazon pushing back like we were trying to figure out like what could be the point of it and yeah the closest thing to friendship which is what our show is about is that 
the closest LGBT concept is that important concept of chosen family. And I remember like watching Milk and like when he's like, get on the bus and go to it, just get on the bus and get out of there. And that thing, it's like, that's the message that everybody has to have. Yeah. And I feel like you, without representation, we as queer people kind of like stumble upon the concept and we have it in our lives without being able to identify it. Yeah. Because on TV, there's there's a mom and the dad, and if there maybe maybe there's a dad and dad, but but it's like a two parent system, mm-hmm. and there is a parent at the head of the system. But sometimes we don't have those parents, right? And seeking out each other and just like spending holidays with each other, yeah. Or even just like maybe we don't have those parents as consistently as we want, like during our, dur- you know. I just went to a wedding in Portland, and the the two one of the groom's parents didn't come because you know they rejected that concept, and um. The other groom was talking about the chosen family in the context of this wedding and it was just like the most powerful thing that it didn't matter that his parents didn't come like it really like we all felt so sorry for them like that they couldn't understand that and then the other straight people are there and like other family members the way he spoke about it it's like i think that they had heard it from the first time too but we have to honor that even within the culture like we have our friends and we don't think about it but we have to really honor it and like i think we have a responsibility to each other around it too like i have to think about these friends that i like love like like jen richards it's like wow if jen's in this place like i should treat her more like a sister you know i need to like think about her birthday a little bit more than i would have maybe with a rando you know in LA especially where you have so many friends right and you just know so many people and it's so warm and nice but you don't you could feel very lonely too because yeah people are just in Palm Springs or in New York or whatever there's so much traveling and stuff like that so I feel like yeah it's such an important concept and it's a concept that we have to like keep alive and honor and make real like I wish there was a way to like when you reach a certain level of friendship to say like <laughs> we're now that's been tattooed you're my uncle like, or whatever you yeah. know yeah there i i don't know it's that's a great yeah. point that there is a responsibility that comes with it too yeah. not just on a thanksgiving night when you're wondering where you're gonna spend it with but, right oh i love like what you, you said birthday. yeah and i have that well the holidays are tough i have that where i just i don't know who i'm gonna spend every holiday with and maybe i'll never know that and it's always wonderful but I've ha- it's taken a long time to adjust to that idea that it's like all my straight friends are like, oh, I have to go back to Iowa or whatever. And I'm glad I don't have to go back to Iowa. No, I've never been, I've never had anything going on in Iowa. But um, yeah, it is a strange thing to be like, to try to build that around everybody else's lives and stuff. Um, even today, you don't know like where like uh, you'll spend the holidays each no, year? Oh, no. wow. Yeah. No, I still don't know. Oh, you said, just, I, I feel like I brought up like a downer, but you said it works out though. No, usually, yeah, right? no, it works out. It always, it always works out. You know, it's like a different group, but it's yeah. like certain people will like my business partner I spent Christmas with them the last couple of years, but you know, I don't know if they're going to go on vacation or not, or, you know, it's not, there's no responsibility towards me. Like, you know, yeah. grandpa would have or something like that. Yeah. You, you mentioned parents before, and I, I still think too, when parents are in the picture, they can be loving and well-intentioned and still fuck you up. Yeah, for sure. You know? <laughs> yeah. My, uh, well, and we talk about this in Danger and Eggs. I, what I was really challenged by, mom, if you're out there, was my, you know, my mom was always present and she took care of us, but there was an, an emotional, like, distance there that I didn't really understand until I started going to therapy and how much it fucked me up. So like in our show, we have this giant chicken mom who Philip talks to, but she'll only balk back. There's like, there's a presence there. And the same thing happens with Dee Dee. We kind of did the same thing with both parents where Dee Dee's father is there, but he's, you know, always in cast and can barely speak. So they both have parents. It's not like they're missing parents and there's these free children, but their parents are, are physically there, but not like emotionally there. And that, is so strange because like when you're wondering why you're so messed up but but nobody put cigarettes out on your arm it's you know you know what uh, bad parenting is but you don't really know what that kind of like physically present neglectful parenting is and with philip the egg his mother is it the mother yeah yeah mother is a very large presence too yeah, yeah and that's intentional there. right so i think with a lot of queer kids 
their parents might be there and their siblings are there, but there's an emotional distance that starts to happen a lot of times between father and son, right? Where it'll just be like, well, you're not the son I kind of wanted. I'm not rejecting you. I'm not literally kicking you out, but I just don't have that emotional connection that, yeah, that I would have maybe with a straight son or something or that I thought I would have or wanted to have. And, and that's really damaging. Yeah. I, you grew up on a uh, Air Force base. Is that correct? I did. Yeah. Well, I, uh, between Montana and Northern Michigan, my mom joined the Air Force as a single mom and, and then we went into the Air Force. Yeah. Uh, how welcoming was that of like a young queerness? Oh, not at all. Okay. I mean, there was, there were other things about it that were, uh, kind of great. Um, like there's no, you do have no sense of class. You know, everybody kind of makes the same amount of money. And even if somebody's an officer, they're still living in base housing. So they have a, a standalone two bedroom house, whereas we lived in a fourplex, but it wasn't a huge difference in class. Nobody drew, drove like amazing cars. You didn't have the sort of that. And then also with race, you know, in the, in the military, there's people from all over. So you're ex- I was in the northern uh, UP of Michigan, but like my classmates were black and brown and white, and we just had much more exposure to people coming from all over the place. So those were like really positive effects of living in the in the military on me. But yeah, queerness and 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 any kind of you know any kind of gender nonconformity with boys was highly frowned upon. Yeah, <laughs> you know it's a very butch culture. I ask just because I try not to like make judgments, you know. Yeah. Wow. Well, the Air Force is the most femme of all of, them, the, of the four. So if people are thinking about yeah. going into it. But it's it's yeah. If you wanna if you wanna be uh, a lot of the, a lot of queer people go in the military. I don't know what the appeal is, but there's stats that like uh, there's a higher percentage of trans people that go into the military than not. It's strange. I I just wonder if it has to do with stability. You know, there's like a massive number of. LGBTQ, especially trans people on the streets as well, like yeah. homeless youth. Yeah. And that's a, somewhere that's going to feed you. Right. Yeah. It's that, I've, heard, a, like I've a, also heard like that people think that they can kind of be scared straight. Like they um, go into the military and do that and you just like don't have to think about it and you don't function. You just butch up. Oh, so yeah. it's like this uber masculine place. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So it kind of works for wow. their queerness. I wonder if mine's too like base of a, uh, like a connecting the dots. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I like the stability thing. I think for any, you know, the the military feeds on poverty and that's interesting though about the equality yeah. with them. Your um, and, and speaking of like the world building of your show, the crowd scenes are the most diverse I've ever seen on TV. That's good. Um, that's something that we just believe in. You know, intersectional everything, and we really. I read. Um, uh, a while ago, Gina Davis Institute said that yes, right. The half half of crowds were more men or more in a crowd scene. It's mostly men, and that's true in animation too. The, the stat I read yesterday was seventeen percent were oh, female. Female. See, I had no idea. But but so she started writing in scripts. You know, the, a crowd forms fifty percent of which are women, and it was like, wow, you have to actually write that into a script. So that that got into my head really early on in, in writing. And, and so we would do it with, especially with like, a, cartoons are so, it's such a straight white dude world. And there's so many archetypes. Like we know what a cartoon cop looks like, right? It's a giant Irish, you know, like we, we grew up on those kind of like archetypes of cartoon police. And so like now still a cartoon police officer is gonna be this. So like, if if I ever write like the fire department comes, it's like half half are women. And you, you always have strict. to do you have to do that. Yeah. You're and kind then, of, yeah. And then for um racial diversity, um, we hired a very diverse crew and they were really looking out for it, you know, internally. There were a few times where I had to say, like, well, let's you know, it shows make there, that, in that the crowds that, yeah, there's disabled people. There's women with head scars. There's different body sizes. Yeah. That's all intentional. And what we were really trying to do is, is show, you know, so many, so many kids shows are like very conservative. You're thinking about like the old suburban 
childhood and we're like no what are the kids growing up going to like what are the worlds that they're all these kids that are living and growing up in condos and all this sort of like urban renewal that's happening and all these kids are growing up in condos and growing up around parks and in cities what is their life going to be like how can the show feel relevant to them in like a few years so we're trying not to do it in like a tokenistic way but we're just trying to do it in like a really inclusive like this is what the world is this is what parks in these small cities with a lot of urban renewal feel like if you look yeah yeah i also think just to feel seen like you you might not see look at this egg and see that looks like me but you can see yourself in the crowd it, i'm thinking about like there was a a queer woman in the crowd with like short buzz hair and like a big brightly colored glasses. I just described Gabby Dunn, but you know, it Gabby looks Dunn's like her. in the background. Is she really? Yes. So it might have been her. Oh my god. Yeah, in the Pride episode, we put Gabby Dunn holding Jen Richards' hands. Oh wait, that's little, amazing. As a little inside joke of me trying to set them up. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, fingers crossed for them. Yeah. Uh, well, good eyes. Oh wow. Yeah. So there, uh, some of those are based on. So a lot of the people in the crowd scenes are just based on people that were working in there or people that I like. Wait, that's and, really funny. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to toot my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> no, congratulations. But yeah, the crowd scenes, when you like look out and you, uh, even just like, the, so the stat for the Gina Davis, 17% of crowds are female makeup. When you look out and you don't see yourself, you don't feel like you belong even in the world. Right. It's a crowd. Right. And I think we can think that's like lesser representation than for LGBTQ people. Yeah. I didn't realize how much it mattered until... Laverne Cox started being Laverne Cox and just really didn't understand how much I didn't believe I could have a career in television until she came along and then and then I didn't really believe I could have a career as a TV writer and then I don't really believe I can have a career being like a visibly large trans person but then difficult people comes out and then she can you know so like there's now I'm starting to believe that like these characters that I've wanted to play and the stuff that I've wanted to write is possible. And I didn't realize that I didn't know it was, that it, that I didn't think it was possible. But I've definitely treated my career like it wasn't possible. I didn't take writing seriously enough. I didn't try to, you know, I tried to like be on the margins of that stuff. I tried out for Transparent to write for the season one and I was totally not ready to like believe that I could be a writer on a live action adult show because there was just n nobody else was doing that and nobody else had asked for it. It, it. So how did you then end up on Yo Gabba Gabba writing for them? Well, I didn't write on Yo Gabba Gabba as an oh. animation supervisor. So that was much more of a technical position. Oh. Yeah. So that, and that, that's the thing is that like, I have had a TV career, but it was all more on a technical side. Um, Less behind the control. camera, not very creative, not very expressive oh, stuff. I yeah. See. It was much more of like a director, supervisory position so what did you think you'd be doing with your life like 20 ish years ago like living in a ground hole on the fringes of society <laughs> you know trying not to die i don't know i i thought i i was just chasing whatever so i wanted to work in comics and i wanted to be a comic book artist and i just wasn't really good enough for the standards at the time um, but there again, no representation. Now I see like, there are all these queer, sorry, I have a hair in my eye. There are all these queer and trans people doing comics and doing comics about their lives and drawing in a much more sort of rudimentary way that isn't the sort of superhero style that I kind of grew up with. And it's like, they're having a great time. And if I would have grown up in that world, I'd have, I'd probably be a cartoonist. Because, wow. Yeah, that's what I really wanted to do. It's almost like the dreams and reality, or, um, yeah you had to choose between like being a trans person and like having like goals, right? You right. Could, like, because yeah. society told you you couldn't have both. Right. For a while. For sure. And I wrote, I just found this journal that I wrote and it kind of weighed the pros and cons of, of transitioning. And one of the big cons was like, I just want to be like a queer man in my career. I cannot imagine man navigating any kind of career as a trans person. I like couldn't see it at all. And I was writing that as a con and I was trying to say like, well, it, it was the biggest con. Like, I'll, I'll, I will lose this career and I'll just have to figure it out. So I really expected to just, like, do more behind-the-scenes stuff. Um, you, you, <laughs> like, you, yeah. just be in a, in a back cubicle somewhere. Wow. Or not work very much at all. Or just write from, write blogs or something. It, it felt like it had to be very isolated. I never imagined that I could really be, like, a showrunner and really... Um, 
be in charge. When the when I optioned my first show, after I transitioned, I cried forever. It was just I could not believe that they would buy a show from a trans person. It blew my mind. Wow. And I just profusely thanked the president of it was Disney, and I just profusely thanked him at a party, and I was like. I can't believe you did this. I can't believe I, I. And it was almost like it felt so unprofessional, but it was almost like I wanted to be in front of him and almost say, like, you're making a mistake. Do you really realize what you're doing? There was this moment where I just had to be in front of him and say, like, wow, you did this. Are you sure? Just and so then six months from then they couldn't be like, oh, yeah, God, or something like, oh, no, I mean, I knew that they all knew. I mean, pitching as a trans person, but. Yeah, do you need to like look at me more? Do you need to really think about it? There was just like this thing and he he was like, No, if you make a good show, like I don't care. And I could not believe that because I'd never been told anything like that. There was never that idea. Wow. So it was cool. I'm just because like wow. Yeah, and then I optioned four shows that year. And then Danger Eggs was one of them that, that went to series. Sorry about this. This is Oh, you're fine. No, I think it's just that yeah. Okay. I'm just thinking about like I don't know I don't think people want to hear white people talking about like white privilege. Mm-hmm. But for me, as like a white man, mm-hmm. if I sell a show, I'm excited and I celebrate and I hope that the show ends up airing. I don't think did they make a mistake? You know? Right. I, I don't think like do they know But as a gay you're gay, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to out you as well as tell everyone you're 28. But as a you hated it, come but on. But as a gay man, I mean, did you always feel that way? I mean, I think no. there are enough examples with Ryan Murphy and things now, but it, it couldn't have been that way for long, you know. No, absolutely not. I think that like I'm unrecognizable to people that knew me 10 years ago, just like the person I am now. Yeah. But I can't help but wonder if I was able to get to this place in terms of confidence because I had these things going for me, which in this society is like a whiteness and maleness. Oh, yeah. And I don't, I don't know, like, what's the, I, don't, I feel like so weird saying that. No, I mean, I definitely, we yeah. have to recognize that, right? Yeah. Like, my whiteness, I have so many trans women of color friends, and it's like my whiteness glares the opportunities that I have. And I really, like, when I was transitioning, when I was thinking about being with my son, I really saw myself, this is, you know, I basically racist, but I really saw myself as being the bottom of the totem pole. And then it was like, oh, shit. <laughs> no, I'm still white, you know? And it took me a while, a while to recognize that, like, I'm not uh, this, like, I still have a lot of privilege, even in my transness. And then when somebody like Caitlyn Jenner comes along, then she just proves that, you yes. know? Yes, yes. Um, and then there's no question. I, I think, too, for me, as a queer person growing up in the South, I suffered. And yet, it and it's very easy for people in that position to think that my, like, suffering is the only thing that mattered. Mm-hmm. And the fact that I was able to get over that, like, well, why couldn't you? Mm-hmm. We're not thinking about, like, other issues that, like, affect other people. That's a huge problem in the geek community, right? Like, straight, white, male geeks suffered for their nerdiness and their social awkwardness. And they still hold on to that stuff. And you get this nerd rage and you see these people that are, like... They're really, they really don't have a concept that, you know, that there are other intersections of suffering and that they have any privileges at all because they did suffer and that is all that matters. It's a huge problem. And me as a trans geeky person have that kind of built in to be like, wow, I really, yeah, I was very self-centered for a long time around that stuff. And I think I, I'm sure I still am. It probably also protected you too, you know, Okay. in order to get to this place. You yeah. ha- kind of had to be. I mean, I definitely think I transitioned. At, I, I know I, it was transition or die. It really felt I put myself into a position where I felt like transition or die. I'm going to kill myself or I'm going to transition. And it was almost like I had to get to that point where I had to believe that it was life or death to have the courage to do it. Like it was really dark. And here you are. You're the show. You're the showrunner. What are your, all your all your titles? You're the showrunner on the yeah. show. The showrunner. Yeah. So I'm executive producer and co-creator. And showrunner just means I'm the executive producer that really runs the the show. But my partner Mike Owens is also like r- ran all the direction and was supervising director and stuff. But you end up with a lot of titles. I also act on the show and uh, I put myself in a lot of different places. You mentioned acting before. Do you have more of those like ambitions? 
Uh, yeah. I like, I've always had comedy ambitions and I did stand up for a while. And I, so it's, it's in there, but it just did not feel possible. Like going on the road, I did a stand up set in Minneapolis and I went, I went back and it was like a, a fight bro broke out. Like people were arguing with each other because I went up and then the person I left the room and the person that went up after me started making fun of me. And then like people in the audience, because they were my friends, cause I was in town and I told everybody to come to the show like rushed the stage took the microphone away from him then all the other comedians were like oh you drunk bitches get off the stage like they were in it and the whole room emptied out and i came back with beers <laughs> to sit down and watch the rest of the show and it was empty so like weird things happen when i do that but now i'm seeing there are like a lot of trans comics out there and there are people that are like and and i look at cameron esposito and it's like you, you know you see these queer comics that are doing very well like touring and stuff yes. and I didn't, I didn't think that was possible. I just don't think anything's possible until it happens. So, oh, well, I'm you know. so glad it did. Yeah. Uh, we are out of time. Oh, wow. You mentioned Cameron Esposito. She's mm -hmm. coming up on our podcast in oh, one yeah. or two weeks. Nice. Actually, we can tease. But um, thank you for being here. This was no, lovely. thank you. Uh, if you want to find out more about your work, should we send them to your Twitter, your Instagram? Sure, I'm at Shadi Potosky on everything. Fantastic. And it's all there. And watch Danger and Eggs on Amazon Prime. Yes, that has not been announced if it has a season two yet, right? No. So we, people comment. What's the best way to help that? Oh, thanks. Yeah, definitely like rate it, comment. Comment, rate it on IMDb, but rate it. It really matters. On IMDb is the best on place. A, Well, no, on uh, anywhere, but anywhere. on Amazon. Amazon, itself. IMDb, awesome. Yeah. Whatever you have an account on. And while it. they're rating things, they can rate us five stars on yeah, iTunes. iTunes. Again, that's the best way for people to find us. And if you're listening to this far in, you want people to find us. Come on. And you can tweet at me at Jeff Masters one if you want to recommend guests. That's the best way to contact us. All right, we'll see you next week. Goodbye. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.